Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness And I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone The weak and made strong In the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord, He is Lord Father God, we come before you this evening excited about what your, ha- your word has for us tonight. We thank you for your presence in our life. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the word of truth that divides uh, our thoughts and what we think to, into what really is true. And so, Lord, may we give our hearts and our minds and our emotion to your truth tonight so that you can divide it from what we think is true to what you tell us is true, so that we can experience a blessed life, uh, a life living in the truth. Lord, may we not uh, fall victim to counterfeit, whether they're a really good counterfeit or a really bad one. We pray in Jesus' name. If you pray with me, say amen. The gospel is an interesting thing. The Bible tells, it to tho- tells us that to those who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, it is our joy. 
Yeah, I mean, it is the thing that we relish, that we love. But to those who are uh, deniers of it, it becomes a, a, a rock. It actually says a rock of offense. This thing that you trip over, that you bang your toes and your shins on. And you're like, ugh. There's actually an, an intensity, a, a, a response to the truth of antagonism. And that's what the Bible says. That's why it says the word of God is a, a sword that has two edges. It cuts two ways. For those that believe it, it cuts open our hard heart and, we, and it tenderizes us. But to those who don't believe, it, it's this, this sword that separates them even further from the truth. So the gospel presents everyone with a decision to either fight or surrender. And everyone is in those two categories on the whole planet. They are either fighting the truth or surrendering to the truth. And you say, well, there's a third category. There's those that are, no, no, you can't be on the, there's no fence. There's no third group. You're either denying the truth that you've been presented in or accepting and surrendering to that truth. And we see this played out in Joshua, the ninth chapter. And remember, as they... As the children of Israel trusted God and were identified in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and when they went through the Jordan, that was a picture of them identifying with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. But now they're on the, in the promised land. And the promised land is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the life that God wants us to possess as the children of God. And that life is full of enemies. It's full of strongholds and cities and, and people that uh, don't want to give up their territory. And so the first one was Jericho. That was a picture of the world. And, and God gave them a mighty uh, victory over the world as they marched silently. And then on the seventh day, seven times, and the walls fell flat. And the only one that survived was the prostitute Rahab and her family who believed that the God of the Israelites was the only true God to believe in. And she and her family were saved alive in the midst of that judgment, a picture of God's grace in the midst of judgment. The next city was Ai. Ai was a picture of the flesh. And the rest of the cities and the people groups that they conquer, it's all the different battles that we face as believers in allowing God to take over territory in our mind, our will, and emotion that used to be just given to the flesh and given to sin. But now he wants to take those one piece of, of territory and land mass and people group at a time, every thought, the Bible says, and bring it under the auspices and captivity and authority of Jesus Christ. Why? So he can form his life in us. So we can actually be different people from the inside out. Religion teaches us to be different people from the outside, and it tries to go in. It, it doesn't go in. It doesn't go in. You can't change from the outside in. We have to change from the inside out. And so this, this whole study of Joshua is taking over former occupied territory in our life by the enemy, and the first thing we need to do is learn how to fight as one. Look in verses 1 and 2 of Joshua chapter 9. Because we're all in this battle together, right, church? I mean, I, I'm fighting the Cheez-Its battle, and you're fighting it too. I, I, I think I'm going to call the study of Joshua the Cheez-Its battle. Verse 1 and 2, as soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland and along the coast of the Great Sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites... And the names of people groups, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. All, it's not that these people are together. These guys fight among themselves. Oh, uh, but the children of Israel, they're coming in. And notice what, they heard of this, and they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. Here are unbelievers, pagans, people that fight amongst themselves, but they all have a common foe. They now have a common enemy. What is that? Joshua leading the children of Israel. And so what do they do? They came together as one to fight these battles. Now, if the pagans can figure that out, shouldn't believers be able to do that? I, I believe one of the major reasons that the church is weak today is because of it, its fractured nature. We don't want to serve as one. 
We don't want to give as one. We don't want to submit as one. I mean, we see it in why our family's fractured. A lack of doing things as one. In order to be one, here's what we think oneness is. If everybody agrees with me, then we'll be one. Now, if everybody thinks like that, we're what? We're going to be fractured. Okay? To be one means you have to what? Yield to the one's thinking. As we yield to the thinking of Christ, to his word, then we can become one. Oneness isn't just the same mindset. It's the same right mindset. Because we're going to find out these people groups, they don't stay one very long. But in Christ, we stay one forever. Okay? We're going to really be one in heaven. Okay? You're going to come over to my house. I'm not even going to tell you to leave. Now, all these people groups are basically the so- southern Amorite city-states that are forming a coalition to battle Israel. You can understand that. But there's one city right in the midst of them. I mean, they're right in the same geographical area. They did not join them. That's the city of Gibeon. That brings up point number two. They didn't join along, they decided not to fight. They said, I don't think we can. Because they've seen, they've heard, I'm sorry, didn't see, they've heard what happened to the kings on the other side of the Jordan. They also now know what God, the God of Israel did to Jericho, the, the greatest city in their part of the world, and now to Ai. And they're like, I think it's fruitless to fight these people. So they came up with plan B. And their plan B was to play a part. Okay? Let's look at verses 3 all the way to 15. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done, the other people, they joined together as one fighting force. But when they heard it, what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they on their own part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins and worn out and torn and mended with worn out patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes. You get the whole picture here. And all their provisions were dry and crumbly, their food, okay? And they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, Oh, oh. We have come from a distant country. So now make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Well, perhaps you might live among us. How can we make a covenant with you? And they said to Joshua, Oh, we're your servants. And Joshua said to them, Well, who are you? And where are you coming from? And they said to him, Oh, from a very distant country. Your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. Boy, we've heard about his fame, and we just had to come see it for ourselves. For we have heard a report of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Basham, who lived in Asheroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, Hey, Take provisions in your hand for the journey and go and meet them and say to them, we're your servants. Come now. Let's make a a peace treaty, a covenant with us. Here is our bread. Look at it. It was warm. We're fresh out of the oven when we took it from our houses. There's our food for the journey on the day that we set to come to you. But now, behold, it's dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them. Behold, they're burst, they're tearing. They can't even hold liquid anymore. And these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not, they looked with their eyes, but they did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. Oh, they said, man, we're not going to join and fight them. We're going to act the part. Well, what was the part? The part was that they were going to act, they presented a very convincing story that they did not live actually in the promised land. They came from a far country on the other side of the Jordan. Notice, they only mentioned Israel's battles with the two kings on the other side of the Jordan. They did not bring up the fact of Israel's victories at Jericho and Ai. Why? Because if they would have known about those two victories, they would have been able to tell that they were hometown people. 
But if they're traveling, oh, we heard about what you did on the other side because that's where we're from. And they played their part perfectly. And a fool tricked Joshua and all the leaders of the congregation of Israel. They presented a very convincing story. Now, this is what the flesh does to us. We get serious about our relationship with the Lord, and we look at the world and say, man, the world doesn't have Jericho. It doesn't have anything for us, and God gives us victory over the world. And then the flesh. We look at the flesh and say, man, all it wants is Jesus. It doesn't want what's good for me. And we go to battle against the flesh, right? And we win a victory. And what does the flesh go? Oh, I surrender. You're a great Christian. In fact, I want to join your forces. And the flesh starts telling us how wonderful we are that we've witnessed. We've actually told someone about Jesus. And, oh, you're a wonderful Christian because we've actually put something in the plate when it goes by. And, oh, you're so faithful at church. And all of a sudden, we what? We stop inquiring of the Lord, what do you want? And we start thinking, we got this. We're doing pretty good. And we start looking at things through our physical eyes again, not understanding that one of the best things that the... It's it's the best as far as winning a victory, worse for us, that the flesh does is deceive us. It tricks us. Here's what the Bible says about my heart. It says, Tom's heart is deceptive. It's wicked and it will trick me. But it can't trip God. Now you're looking and say, man, Tom, I didn't know that about you. Well, guess what? The Bible says it about you too. I'm just saying it about me because if I said it about one of you, you'd be all offended. Think about that. Here's God's estimation of my heart, my feelings, my thoughts, that it's deceptive and that it tricks its owner, me. And he says, don't trust your heart. Instead, Trust my word. Amen. Trust my word. Now, see, this is tough, especially when we've done some right things. When I've done a couple good things, it's easy to start saying, man, I'm kind of a special fella. Somebody else didn't see that. Look what we did here. You got your tithing statements in there. Man, honey, look at what we gave this year. We don't need to talk to God anymore about our giving. We don't need to ask him. We got it. Oh. That's the big mistake when we start cutting out God's voice and make decisions based upon what we see. Because we see a very limited part of life, don't we? I'm shocked that Joshua fell for this. But remember, he was discouraged after the defeat of Ai. Remember? And God had to come encourage him. And lift up his chin and say, listen, Joshua, I'm going to give these guys in your hand. And they just, I mean, they just ran over AI. And just like anybody else, he's like, yeah, feeling like a leader again. And these guys come and even the elders, they ask a question. They say, hey, how do we know you're not our neighbors? Oh, we've come from a far, far country. It's not enough just to ask the questions. It depends who you're asking the questions to. So you can ask me, Pastor, what do you think? And I'll give you my best, very limited answer. But boy, when you ask God, He gives you the exact answer you need. And they cut God out of the process. But this is a tricky thing. Because you know what this does? We make decisions when we're not listening to God. And those decisions linger in our life for a very long time. What do you mean? The effects of this decision is going to affect Israel for centuries. Literally centuries they're going to deal with the Gibeonites because they didn't seek the face of God on this. Now, the people here, the reason they lied, let's talk about the Gibeonites. Because a lot of people look at them and say, oh, they're, they just fooled. And yes, they did. They lied. But you know why? They didn't understand grace. They didn't understand it. I don't think anything in their culture prepared them for this. Going out to meet Joshua and saying, listen, we live in the next town. It's called Gibeon. We don't want to fight you. We want to surrender. There's nothing. That, see, there's, there's, 
this mindset in the world that says, man, if we surrender, we lose. Now, when it comes to Christ, when you surrender, you gain. And so people look at religion through a very slanted eye. They're like, oh, they're, what do they tell you? You talk to people at work, oh, I go to this great church, and they're like, oh, they're just after money. That slanted view. Oh, they're just after this. Oh, they just want to do this to you. Oh, they just want to take advantage of you. I, I don't know who they are, but I've, I've yet to identify them in our church. If they means me, I'm doing a very poor job of taking advantage of you. Okay, I, I need to up my game. What is that? It's a worldly view of right living. They don't understand it. Why? Because the Bible says those things are spiritually discerned. And the natural man can't grasp it. So here's these people that are in the natural state. They're unsaved. They're seeing God do these mighty things. They know they don't want to be the recipients of those mighty things. And they think our only option is to trick them into making a promise. That's our only chance at living. No, it's not. Just like Rahab, if they would have thrown themselves at the mercy of God, there would have been room for them in the promises of God. Amen? There would have been room for them. They didn't understand grace. It's our responsibility to explain grace. Just think about this conversation. If these guys would have, would have been looking at the right things, they could have said, Joshua and leaders could have said, now listen, if you just happen to be people that live in this area, I just want you to know this. If you will yield yourself to our God, we can make peace with you. But they didn't say that. They didn't say that. They were too busy trying to decipher the message instead of being about the master's business. Boy, that happens a lot of times in our life, doesn't it? So they mentioned these battles on the other side of the Jordan to, to make their argument more convincing. And there's a question about right questions and wrong questions. In Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, the Lord was giving the law to Moses. He said, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gergassites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, here they are, the Hivites, that's who they were, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Okay? The right question would be, God, what do you want us to do with these people? We don't know who they are. We know you know who they are. And I believe at that point, God would have revealed to them who they are. And they could have said, okay, you got two choices here. Submit or die. Submit or die. Isn't that the call of the gospel? Submit or die or suffer judgment. Yeah. See, the world has been lulled to sleep thinking, oh, there's no judgment. There's no, what, there's no answering to the God that made us coming? Yes, there is. That's why this life, we need to ask the right question. Am I in the grace of God? Do I know him as my Savior? Am I living? Am I listening to him today so he can enable me to defeat my enemies that are trying to deceive me and take advantage of me? Because if we don't hear from God on a day-to-day basis, we're getting taken advantage of. So they did not inquire of the Lord. They made a peace treaty with a group of deceivers. Now, you look at this, you say, wow. That kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth. This happens to us all the time. We don't ask of the Lord. We let our uh, mindset, our passions overwhelm us. We make decisions. And when we recognize the mistake, sometimes you can't undo them. You've got to live with the consequences of those decisions. You do. You've got to live with the consequences. Here's where grace comes in. Okay, God's grace has a reach beyond our grasp, okay? It does. And God's going to give the children of Israel grace to deal with the Gibeonites, and he's also going to give the Gibeonites grace to be included in his promises. Look at verse 16 all the way to 27, okay? Verse 16. At the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors, 
and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities, and on the third day, uh, now their cities were Gibeon, uh, Chepareth, Beeroth, and uh, kiriath Jerem. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to all the congregation, well, we've sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. Boy, underline that. That's a great principle. Because of the oath that we swore. And the leader said to them, let them live so that they become cutters of wood, wood choppers, and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said of them. And Joshua summoned them, and he said to them, why did you deceive us, saying, we are very far from you when you dwell among us? Now, therefore, you're cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua, look at this answer, because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you, and we did this thing. And now behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel. They did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place that he should choose. Wow. The reach of grace. Can God's grace reach a people that have not listened to him and made a decision that is going to cost them dearly? And can God's grace reach the deceivers? Can he reach them and change them? If God's grace doesn't reach those two groups of people, we are living without any hope. Because those two groups of people represent everybody on the planet. Every single one of us at times in our Christian life, we have made decisions where we did not get the counsel of God and we, it was a major mistake. It was a major mistake. And we got fooled. We got deceived. Our heart tricked us. Also, before we were saved, we lived in a state of deception. Because that's why. That's how the world works. Now, you're not going to find truth out there. No. Why? How can you find truth from a, a population of people that are deceived from the truth? The first, when, when truth appears to your life, it appears in this form. I am headed towards judgment by the God that made me and my only hope is to cast myself upon him for mercy and grace. Amen. Then you start seeing things through a lens that shows you what the truth is. But until then, we're deceived just like everybody else. And so these people, with the knowledge that they had, they approached Israel with the knowledge that they had, and God did not turn them away, and he did not destroy them. I want you to notice that. Now, first thing I want us to look at is the authority of a vow. That's what this, that's the main subject matter in this section that we just read is the authority, the absolute ironclad authority of a vow, a promise. And what does that mean? Well, here's what God's word says in the law about vowing a vow in Deuteronomy 23. When God gave Moses the law, he said, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you. And you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what is past your lips. For you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. I can take you to other places. That, I mean, when I looked up vows, there, pff, there's scripture all over. If you vow, vow, even to your own hurt, 
Scripture says, keep that vow. Keep what you have promised so the Lord doesn't so we don't put the Lord in a position to judge us for breaking a vow. This thing, a vow or a covenant, was very important to God. Actually, it was the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the Lord, the name of the Lord your God in vain. We have, we have boiled that down to a cuss word. That's not what it means. It's talking about this right here. When we make a promise... As representatives of Christ, the words that come out of our mouth, we are going to stand in judgment for them, whether we keep those promises or we fail to keep those promises. Say, so, oh, you don't understand, Pastor. I, I got tricked. I got this. I got that. I, or I didn't understand its ramifications. That's why Scripture in Deuteronomy just said, you should fear making a vow because you're going to be held responsible for whatever promise comes out of your mouth. Amen. You know why there's a lot of bitterness between children and parents? The breaking of vows. Parents will make a vow. They'll tell a little crumb snatcher kid, five, six-year-old, yeah, someday we're going to do that. You forget about it. I forget about it. Why? We're old. But that five or six-year-old, they count on it. They count on it. They'll bring it up later, and you'll, we'll even tell them, oh, I, I, I didn't say that. And a kid looks at you and says, oh, yeah, you did, Dad. Right, amen. What do you mean? It's, you, you, you're not going to keep that? You're not going to keep that? And they get devastated. That's why a lot of young people don't want anything to do with their parents' religion. Because why? They don't want a part of a religion that doesn't keep its promises. They're looking at somebody, and think about it. Our young people in America, they're much more likely to join a gang, a bloodthirsty gang, than a church. Why? Because at least those gangs keep their word. When they say, we're going to kill you, they mean it. <laughs> church people say, hey, we're going to take care of you. Maybe. Maybe. Hey, we're going to stay married. Maybe. Hey, I'm going to be there for you, honey. Maybe. Maybe. Thick and thin, right? Maybe. Ooh. See, when you start looking at it that way, our vows mean something, don't they? To break a vow is a breach of the third commandment. To not take the Lord's name in vain. To not take the Lord's name in vain. So here's what God does. Look at this. This is a beautiful picture. He takes these people that don't know him. All they know is his judgment is coming. And they run, and in, their, in the best of their knowledge, they placed themselves. They said, we heard about your God. We knew his might and power. And we did not want to be the recipients of it. Therefore, this is what we did. And look at what God did. He made room for them in the promises of his nation. And he uses Israel to now look after them because of their covenant promise with them. And they're made servants to do what? Cut wood for all the people's fires and for the altar, okay? And water, to drawers of water out of the wells for the same purposes, to live, to drink, to bathe, and all that. A lot of work. But he gave, they entered into a life of servitude underneath the covenant. Now, isn't that quite a picture? You and I took the knowledge that we had of God, which when, before we were saved was very limited. Here's what we knew. I'm a sinner. Judgment's coming my way. And the God that made me and died for me, man, he's my only hope. We might not even have been clear. A lot of us got saved and we were deceiving our own hearts. We were just trying to get out of trouble. Tell me we haven't gotten, gone to God that time because we, it wasn't out of an altruistic heart of love. It's because we were just trying to dodge the hammer we saw coming. And did God say, oh, no, no, no. You didn't come with the right attitude. No, his grace reaches beyond it and does something to us that we're not even expecting. 
includes us in his promises. Now, I'm not saying that people that aren't serious about their sin, okay, get to avoid judgment just because they don't want to have judgment. No, but these people said, we heard about your God and we cast ourselves on you. We're yours. What are you going to do with us? Those are the exact kind of people that God's grace is for. You guys, those are that kind of people. And he includes them in his promise. So what do you mean he includes them in his promise? He makes them cutters of wood, not only for people's home fires, but also for the sacrificial fires. God says, I want you up close to see what I did for you. Amen. He draws them right to the sacrifices and says, this is what it cost for you to get a go free card. It cost an innocent sacrifice. That's what it cost. You got to believe these people who are not dead like their neighbors at AI and they're not dead like the other people that join together. They're going to get dead next Wednesday. Okay, those five kings are just a little foreshadowed, but they're all, it's not going to go well for them. But these guys, they get to be alive. Why? And then God brings them close to his sacrificial system and says, this is how I gave you grace. It cost me my son. It cost me my son. And what did they do? They went into a life of servitude. How many Christians today are there? We're saved. We're forgiven. We have a home in heaven. And we're, hey God, what have you not done for me today? It's not a life of servitude to him. We think salvation is a life of him serving us. My whims, my wants, my desires. We got it backwards. Man, when we get saved, we get the whole spiritual enchilada. I mean, there's nothing lacking there. We get it all when we get the Holy Spirit. We get the hope of Christ living within us. We have the future, the gift of eternal life. It's set in the blood of Christ. It's never going to change. We are now free to serve him menially. An everyday instance. Well, what can be more everyday than chopping the wood for your fire and drawing water to drink and bathe in? That's where God wants us to serve him. In everyday life. Everyday life. He wants that to be our mindset. He wants us to look at our marriage. He wants me to look at my relationship with my wife, Cindy, as what? Serving him. He says, remember, she belongs to me, Tom. I know she's your wife. She's my daughter. Amen. And he wants me to serve her as unto him. And scripture says, he wants me to serve my boss, that's you guys, as unto the Lord, not as men pleasers. I'll take much better care of you if I know I'm going to stand before him and give answer for how I served you. Just think what an employee that will make us. If we're like, oh no, it's not about the paycheck, it's not about how many years, it's not about the union, it's about I'm going to stand for God, what I did to that plant, what I did to that office, how I served him there. Amen. That's exactly the point he wanted us to see. We receive his grace in order to enter into a life of service to the God who did everything for us. That's the joy. I think if Christians got back their heart of service, they would experience more joy. And I'll tell you when I get frustrated with life. When I sit around and start thinking, what isn't happening for me? Oh, man, I can't hear. I get frustrated with that. You know, I, I got to hearing aids, but... Uh, I mean, they, they have helped greatly. But they didn't give me back my lost hearing. So I'll be sitting at, in, a, in a group table and people will be having conversations and I'll be like, I'd love to hear what these people are saying. Especially if there's two or three at one. I can hear you. I hear the noise. I just have absolutely no idea what you're saying. 
And after a while, it's kind of hard to go around the table going, what did you say? Excuse me. Wait, tell me in a minute. What did you just say while he was, oh, I was asking him what he just said. And so you just, and you can start thinking inward and going, man, I'm excluded from life. This isn't fun. God, where's my hearing? Where's my this? Where's my hair, by the way, too? Okay. And since we're at it, where did my youth go? Because it's gone too. So we're like, oh, you're a young whippersnapper. No, I'm not. I'm not a young whippersnapper. I stepped off something the other day and I was, my knee went like that. I was like, what is that? I slapped it and it said, don't give me that. I'll break forever. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, what? It, it, it happens. And we can, we can look at life and start looking at it, how it just impacts us. And before we know it, we're not serving God anymore. We got a bitter attitude and we're walking around. There's no joy in our life. We're an angry Christian. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. And pass the ammo too, whatever that means. So we can shoot somebody because we're not getting ours. And no one wants to join with that Christian, right? How can you have oneness when we're all sitting around thinking about what we're not getting? No. That's what's wrong with America. Everybody's worried about what they're not getting. And nobody's worried about what they're giving. Yeah. We had a president that said, he, he wasn't this morally upright guy. You know? But Mr. Kennedy got it right. And his inaugural address when he said, man, if we're going to make it as a country, we've got to quit asking what America's going to do for me, and we've got to ask what we can do for our country. He understood it. That's how it works. That's how we become one nation under God, indivisible. By what? By asking what we can do. I would love if it was... Okay, staff meeting at church. What are we going to do with all these people who want to help? That's not a conversation I've had in 27 years. Never had that conversation. I've had this conversation many times. How are we going to talk some people into volunteering? I've had that conversation basically monthly. But not the other way around. Why? This is important stuff. Once we have been in the grace of God, he has accepted us as our deceitful selves. We need to place ourselves under God and into a life of voluntary service, which brings the joy that we're so looking for. It brings the fulfillment. There's nothing like giving of yourself out and being wrung out like a washcloth fully for the Lord. And then it's like, yeah, that's what this is about. That's what it is. Let me tell you, we need to seek God through the knowledge we have in him. We already have plenty of knowledge. Let's seek him with the knowledge that we have and submit to him right there so we can experience his grace in a greater place. Let me close with this. You guys know that this last fall, late fall, and I think it was the first week of December, my memory serves me correctly, I... I, I did my first go to a foreign land missions trip. And of course, um, I remember when I was talking to uh, my, my friend of the ministry, Cameron South, who grew up in church here, who's, you know, his church in Kansas City played, paid for my plane ticket. I you know he was talking to me on the phone, and he said, Man, why didn't you like start with, you know, like maybe, you know, Honduras or something? Or maybe Mexico, India, right off the bat? And I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm, it just God orchestrated it, man. And he was like, well, I hope it doesn't <laughs> run me forever going back. And, and I was so excited about going. I wasn't excited about the plane trip, going or coming back home. That was dr- absolute drudgery, okay? That was, that was difficult. And I didn't, want, I, I didn't look forward to being gone from my wife. I hated that. 
I, I love the fact that God gave me a great travel companion. Paul, you were beautiful. I mean, he, he was a wonderful guy to, to go with. He was real low maintenance. Thank you, Jesus, for low maintenance guy, right? And uh, so, so that was great. But what I was excited about was just getting wrung out. I came home excited and adrenaline filled. And on Monday, after I had returned home, I felt like a Mack truck had hit me for about the next three weeks. I was exhausted. But I had this leftover joy. Because, tell you the truth, I didn't get anything out of it. I went to give. Because they had nothing for me. We had it for them. And we just went and wrung it out. And there was just such joy in that. And it it shocked me because when I came back home, I was like, man, I'm I'm wondering if if ministry here has become too much of a two-way street. You know, I'm, I'm giving my all, but I'm expecting something in return. And that ruins it. It, it perverts it. God is going to bless us beyond our dreams and imagination, Scripture says, if we will serve him with our whole heart. Amen. You're like, okay, I'm waiting for the surpassing my dreams and imagination. God, no, the first part is chopping the wood and getting the water with all our heart. That's the first part. We devote ourselves fully to him with no expectation of getting back. And he will give us the fulfillment, the purpose, the joy. And I mean, we'll be clicking on all eight engines. The people will be looking at you going, man, it's minus six out. Why are you so happy, man? God just give me this joy. And man, we need some joy, church. Don't we? I need some joy. You need some? My, My joy cup's a little empty. Wow, where's the filling station? With the service. The service. Now I'm going to go home tonight, I'm going to rub my feet, rub the feet of my wife even better than before. Why? Because I'm going to look for some joy out of it. I'm going to look for some joy out of it. I, I performed a task recently in, for her and our, our family recently. It was a highlight of my last two weeks. I did this thing and with a simple phrase, she just... My, my, my joy cup just went... <laughs> it just went up. And you know what she said? Thank you so much for doing that. I went... <laughs> just think, if everywhere we turn, if we were such servants, we were always, you know, serving, and, and people were, you know, co-workers, hey, thanks for doing that. Spouse, thanks for doing it. Our kids, oh, mom and dad, thanks for that. People at church, oh, thanks for doing a Sunday school class. Thanks for blessing my kids. Thanks for doing a small group. Thank you for, just think about our joy. Constantly getting, what? Loads of joy poured in. Loves of joy. But remember, it's all about that sacrifice. We don't serve just to get joy. We serve because of that sacrifice, what Christ did for us. What Christ did for us. And we are to make that love known to the world through serving others. Let's stand to our feet this evening. And I dare not trust.